I want to begin this morning by reading Exodus chapter 20, verse 2. Exodus 20, as you, you recognize, is the chapter of the Ten Commandments. And it starts with a verse that's uh, very important to an understanding of the commands. Verse 2. Exodus 20, verse 2. <clears throat> I am the Lord your God, which have brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. In another place it says, I brought you out with a strong and mighty arm out of the house of bondage. This is the context of the law. You were in slavery in Egypt. This is a type or a symbol of God's final deliverance of his people from this world of suffering and sin to their heavenly rest. What was the rest for the children of Israel? It was entering over into Canaan land, right? There's another day spoken of in Hebrews that uh, is about the heavenly rest that we're all looking forward to, right? Another day. Egypt is a symbol of sin in the Bible that involves all of us, doesn't it? Every day of our lives, God in the person of Jesus Christ by his holy life and sacrifice and that perfect life has taken our sin which are against us. Taken our sins away, nailing them to his cross in the person of Jesus. I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. This sometimes can be a troublesome text for some people. And we need to understand it very clearly if we can Look at it here, Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. It says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Notice the expression against us. Which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. My, oh my, what he did that day uh, and the night before is uh, without, without understanding for me. I can't wrap my head around it as the more I think about it. Let's look at another one, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Back to the left a few pages, Daniel 9, verse 24. <clears throat> this is what Jesus did. In his brief sojourn in this, on this planet, Hebrews 9, verse 24, six things are mentioned here. And uh, I just love to read them because I, they're mine, right? And they're yours. And we can share this with our neighbors. Hebrews 9, verse 24. I'm sorry, Daniel 9, verse 24. I'm glad, I'm glad for Lamont. <laughs> 9, verse 24. We have it all? Seventy weeks are determined upon your people and upon your holy city to finish transgressions, to make an end of sins. That's the second thing. To make reconciliation for iniquity. To bring in everlasting righteousness. Is that what he did? Amen. He did that. To seal up the vision, of, the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Jesus was set apart for those six things. And when he was finished and went back to heaven, he was victorious over all of this. This is what he did when he came here the first time. It was accomplished. All we need to do is say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I believe and I trust you. If we'll do that, I'll tell you what, a miracle takes place. And he ministers, and he went back to heaven, and today he ministers the blessings of that triumphant deliverance, the blessing of his perfect work. And uh, Hebrews 9, verse 12. If we could turn to the right, over to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 9, verse 12. I just love to read this verse, too. Hebrews 9, verse 12. In the Old Testament, it was blood and, blood and goats. That all came to an end. It was nailed to the cross. That was all against us, because sin is against us, right? These were sin offerings. Notice verse 12. Neither by the blood 
of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And we could look at another one while we're looking at texts. Romans chapter 8. And I'm sorry, Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 18. We need to take all the comfort we can out of this. There isn't a lot of comfort around us, right? Take your comfort out of this. Amen. Romans chapter 5, verse 18. Romans 5, verse 18. I just love to hear the pages of the Bible. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men to the justification of life. So Jesus is that second Adam. He is the last Adam it talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, 4 and 5, 40, 45, I'm sorry. We were lost in the first Adam. All of us are here this morning because the first Adam sinned, right? Otherwise, we'd probably be in the new earth. We may be walking around in the garden on a beautiful Sabbath day, right? But God has reconciled the world to himself in the person of his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the backdrop for our study today. He has already forgiven purged, cleansed the sins of humanity as he promised to do in the Old Testament. Daniel 9, 24, what we just read. He's already done that. In the person of one, our sins are washed away. AD 31. And he has restored humanity into oneness with himself in the person of one. Can we kind of get that concept? In the person of one, it is a man who sits beside the throne of his father in heaven, one of us. He's our next of kin. He is our, our closest kinsman, redeemer. Representative man. He was man as man was, lent, was meant to be. Even the man Christ Jesus. The man after taking our sins is restored completely. And he sits at the right hand. He took our sins. He was made sin for us, right? He was counted as the guilty one in my place. Today he's in heaven above all principalities and power. A victory over the, a victory over the devil. A man as man was meant to be. be he became the substitute and surety for, for us all. Uh, Hebrews 9.22 talks about him being our surety. If you ever, ever have co-signed for somebody and the bill comes due and it's not paid, guess what? You get a letter in the mail. I've done that. <laughs> I know somebody else here has done that too. <laughs> he paid all the bills. Who are the bills owed to? You know, it's the law that condemns us, right? The law shows our sins. And... Uh, he paid all the bills. You know, a million lifetimes wouldn't be enough to pay the bills that's owed that we owe the law. We are deep in debt. Jesus told a parable about that one day. He paid all our bills <clears throat> with his precious blood and spotless life. And in addition, he is the Lord of glory. My, what a, what a, what a, what a being. When he came to this world, he took on an existence he never ever knew before. He has redeemed the human race by the blood of the cross, by becoming our next of kin, the true kinsman redeemer. This is huge. <clears throat> and all men everywhere are, the, are precious in his sight. That's why we can confidence, with confidence sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. We can sing that with confidence. We're all children here, right? Children of the great king. And most of the world knows nothing about this. Maybe even some of us may have some questions about certain parts of the good news. Hope not. Somebody might think about what we're going to talk about now as being cheap grace. I'll tell you what, there's no such thing as cheap grace. It costs somebody a lot to get it for us. 
and our appreciation, our thanksgiving for that is, uh, you know, we can never measure up to the thanksgiving and praise that is required, that is only right and just. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 22. Isaiah 44, verse 22. I have, what is the tense in this verse? I'd like to look what the, see what the tense is. Is it past or future or present? I have blotted out as a thick cloud your transgressions and as a cloud your sins. Return to me, for I have what? I have redeemed you. All past tense here. Even in Isaiah's day, it was past tense because Jesus is the lamb slain from when? the foundation of the world, and the God who counts something as being accomplished before it even happens. Notice the experience of Abraham. Romans 4, verse 17. Romans 4, verse 17. Experience of Abraham. Abraham is the father of the faithful, right? Abraham... This is Abraham's chapter. Four, verse 17. As it is written, I have made, what's the tense here? I have made you father of many nations. It's not really a past tense. <laughs> okay. It's okay. Very good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Je- That's okay. Jesus is our past, present, and future, isn't he? <laughs> I have made you father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who makes alive the dead and calls things which be not as though they were. I'm glad God's like that. That he has that, that capability. Abraham was considered by God to be the father of many nations before, before Isaac was born. And the type of all of this is Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. Let's turn to that again. Exodus 20, verses 1 and 2. Let's reread these wonderful verses. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. It says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God which have brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And then verse 3 says, You shall have no other gods before me. And then follows, Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Through the law of God, right? At least nine times it says, Thou shalt not. In full view of all of this, this great salvation, God says, Thou shalt not do. Thou shalt not make. <laughs> Nine times in, this, in, this, in the law of God it says that. He's saying this. I have not asked you to do something. I've asked you not to do something. Right? I've asked you not to do these things. I want us to see this this morning. I have asked you to refrain from doing something. Don't have other gods. Don't make graven images. Don't make, take my name in vain. Don't bear, my, bear, bear false witness. Don't kill, murder, don't steal. Don't covet. These are God's two tables of love. If I love Michael here, I won't lie to him nor steal from him, right? That's how God loves us. In fact, that's the greatest definition of love in all the Bibles in, Revel- in Romans chapter 13. Love God supremely, first table. Love your neighbor, second table. All this is by not doing. Not doing. Verse 4, love God. That's the vertical relationship we have with him. And love your neighbor. I have some good neighbors over in my neighborhood. I'm looking at one of them right now. We don't steal from one another. We don't lie to one another. Why? Because we love each other. Jesus said they will know you are Christians by your what? Love. 
rather than ask us to do and do, he says, thou shalt not do the works of the flesh. Don't do those things. Therefore, you're good always that you don't do these things in disregard to God and our neighbors. I'd like to have us turn to Romans 13. That's uh, the best definition of love in all the Bible, I think. Romans chapter 13. We read it last night in a Bible study, I think. Didn't we do it last night? Whoever was there. Uh, Romans chapter 13, 8 to 10. Here's what it says. Are we all there? Say amen. amen. O no man anything but to love one another. For he that loves another hath fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there be any other commandment, and there are other commandments, aren't there? If there be any other command, how many of them are there? There's 10 of them. It is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love works no ill to the neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. All this, do not, do not, are motivated by love, thus fulfilling the law. That's how we love God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, right? Graven images. Don't take my name in vain. That's how we love those around us. That's how we love God, by not doing, not doing. Talk about a works program, not doing. So all these do nots are summarized by the principle of love, a thing of the heart, heart religion. Then in the very middle of the law is this commandment. God says, rest. That's what you do when you don't, right? <laughs> That's what you do when you don't. Thou shalt not, you rest. The wicked don't rest. Uh, Jim was telling a story last night, or yesterday, I guess, Sunday afternoon. He was carried out by a riptide. The bridge on the, on the shore only looked like, like about that big. And it was happening kind of imperceptibly to him. And time he got back, I'm, I'm glad he got back, aren't you? Yeah. Jim Miller. Now, I'll tell you what, he wasn't rested when he got to the shore. The wicked don't rest. I'm not talking about Jim now. They are like the restless ocean. The Bible says the wicked are always doing, 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 doing. In the New Testament, the idea of rest is the grand principle upon which our, our faith is based. Resting in the completed work of Jesus. We've been studying Hebrews this quarter. Aren't you glad? I just love the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4. Let's look at some of these verses. Hebrews chapter 4. Actually, these Sabbath school lessons kind of spawned this sermon, actually. I want to read a few verses here that you're familiar with. Hebrews 4, verses 1 and 2. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left to us of entering into his rest, any of you would seem to come short of it. For to us was the gospel preached, as well as to them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. And verse 4, and he's, for he spake in, in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. I've got to tell you, don't use these passages to prove the Sabbath, okay? This is talking about rest, of which the Sabbath is an example, right? Okay. I've tried to do that in my past, and it's a dead end. Don't do that, <laughs> especially if you're in a Bible study and, and uh, you know, Got to be very careful that we don't we'll get into some difficulties. Verse 4. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest on the seventh day from all of his works. And then uh, verse 6. Seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. What was the rest that was given to the children of Israel when this was given, first, first, first of all. What was the rest? Entering into Canaan land, right? That was their rest, inherited land where they could, where they could live and they could serve God and they could witness for him throughout the world. 
That was their rest. Now verse uh, 9. There remains, therefore, a rest. Remains a rest for the people of God. What might that rest be? When we get over there, right? I'll tell you what, we all want, how many of you want to go to heaven? Yeah, we all want to go to heaven. How many, want to, how many of you like that promise about going to heaven if you're not ready? No, we want to be ready for his coming so we can enter into that rest. Verse 10, for he that is entered into his rest, he hath also ceased from what? His own works, there's the law of God. Works of the flesh. No room for works of the flesh here. He says, rest from all of that. Resting from our own works. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will do what? I'll give you rest. We can have that rest even now. Allow God's love to flow through you. That's God's rest. Even our best works are so defiled as they flow through the defiled, uh, the corrupt uh, the corrupt channels of humanity, they are of no value with God. Actually, you can read that thought in a book. First Selected Messages is 341. Wonderful one. If you have that book, I encourage you to read that whole chapter. They must be cleansed with blood, even our best works. Blood that has been provided by Jesus. We are made acceptable to God by his perfect life and his obedient death. That thought is in Romans 5, verse 10. I think we read it already. Jesus is the substitute man, your substitute, my substitute. The holy prophet Isaiah said that all of our righteousnesses are what? Filthy rags. The holy prophet said that. And when he came into the presence of God in Isaiah chapter 6, he said, oh, I'm so undone, for I have seen the king in his glory. Don't put your faith in your degree of performance, nor anybody else's. We don't get in, we don't go on the, on the shirt tails of somebody else, do we? Don't put your faith in princes, but in the righteousness of Jesus, our substitute. Turn your eyes upon him. That's the principle of resting. That's the principle of Sabbath that's talked about in Hebrews chapter four. I have uh, brought you out of the land of Egypt with a strong and mighty arm. Let me ask you, can you believe that? Galatians 2.20 2, says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. I'm crucified. In Christ, I'm dead. Reckon it so, it says in Hebrews, in Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Reckon it so. Believe it. The Bible says, believe. He said that to the jailer, right? Believe it. Dead people don't sin. If you are in Christ, you do no sin. It says that in 1 John. Let's look at it. 1 John 3, verse 9. 1 John 3, verse 9. In him we are justified, looked upon as though we had never ever sinned, in fact. 1 John 3, verse 9. I look at my life and I say, how can that be true? Believe it. We have a full salvation in Jesus. 1 John 3, verse 9. It says, whosoever is born of God does not what? Commit sin or practice sin, as my margin. For his seed remains in him, for he cannot sin because he is born of God. It's a tremendous miracle takes place in the new birth. Look at it, believe it. The justified believer puts his faith in an infinite righteousness, even the righteousness of Christ. And that justified believer is declared righteous on the basis of the righteousness of another. When the fiery serpents came into the camp, they were all bit, people were being bitten by the poison serpents, right? And Moses said, look and live. How could that be? It's a miracle. Acknowledge him and his great plan for you. The ancient Jews did not rest. They did not enter rest. Their rest 
was Canaan land, but they died in the wilderness for, in 40 years wandering. They refused rest by belief. They, they refused rest of unbelief. But Hebrews talks about another day. Another day is coming. And what day is that? What, who's that for? It's for all of us entering into his rest. He's preparing mansions for you. If I go, I will come again and receive. That in my father's house there are many mansions, right? If it were not so, I would have told you. He's preparing a place for us. That's our eternal rest. That's the day of our rest in the heavenly Canaan. They didn't, they didn't enter in because it was too good to be true. Giants in the land. My, oh, my. Walled cities. Impenetrable area. They had seen the Lord come out of, take them through the Red Sea. They saw water from the rock, bread in the desert. Pillar of cloud by night, pillar of fire by day. Down there in the sanctuary, they could see the, the Shekinah glory through the tent. And they didn't believe it. It's all that simple. Let's look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. We're just kind of having a little Bible study here this morning. Acts chapter 2, 22 and 23. Acts 2, 22 and 23. Ye men of Israel, Acts 2, do all have it? Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourself also know, him being delivered to the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified him. He's telling them you have crucified him. That's what every unbeliever does, unwittingly, wittingly, or unwittingly. That's, that was the ultimate work of the flesh, the rejection and crucifixion of the Son of God. It's the ultimate wickedness, and we all have a part in that. There's no rest there. So the big question is, if it is all we have to do is rest, from our fleshly carnal works, how do I rest? That's the big question. How do I rest? Certainly it's not by doing and doing and doing. That, that, that's not rest, is it? The, the wicked are like a restless sea, but by believing. There's a tremendous verse in John 6, 29. We won't take the time to, read, to look at it, but it, here's what it says. It says, this is the work of God. You know how, how it ends? that you believe. <laughs> this is the work of God. That's a work, right? That you believe. How sweet are the words in Acts 16 to the jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, you and your house. And they were baptized. Is there any, any, is there any exercise of, of un, I'm sorry. Is there any excuse for unbelief? No. So, then faith comes by hearing. I just love the children's story this morning. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Spending some precious time with God in the word for the purpose of knowing him. Is there any reason for unbelief of his righteous work on our behalf? We have in God's word all the evidence we need. The Red Sea, the food, the water in the desert, the fire by night, the cloud by day. Jesus paid a horrendous price for our forgiveness by his, shed that he, by his blood that he shed for many. And uh, we're all part of the minis. I'd like to have us turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verses 8 to 11. Romans 5, 8 to 11. These were parts of our scripture reading this morning. But God commends his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Much more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his what? 
What kind of a life was that? Perfectly righteous life. He never, ever sinned. His hand was always stretched out for others. You know, there's a song that some people sing. It's been, I haven't heard it for a while, but others, yes, others. This let my motto be. Others, yes, others, that I might live like thee. This is, uh, this is how we are overcomers, right? And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. And Romans 4, 25. Romans 4, verse 25. Back to the left, just a little bit. Romans 4, verse 25. Here's what it says. Who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our what? Justification. The believer in Jesus, God looks at that person as though he had never, ever sinned. He is declared righteous before the holy law. And chapter 5, verse 1, therefore, whenever we see a therefore, we should ask ourselves, what is it there for? Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you think there's rest in that? How many of you want a peaceful life? Yeah, we all want that, right? Amen. Peace. It's the Holy Spirit that opens the door of faith and repentance and plants love in our hearts, Romans 5, 5. Pray for the Holy Spirit. These are all things of how we enter into that rest. Pray for the Holy Spirit. Don't turn his converting power away. That's how we find rest. That was the powerful message in the first century. The disciples ran all over the planet telling about this, about the resurrection and the and the. And the Victorious light that we have in him. Faith is a fruit, faith is a fruit of, the, of the gospel teaching as the Holy Spirit ministers daily to our needs. And new creation results. And godly work, works result. Ephesians, I can't, I can't help, uh, help but having us turn to a text in Ephesians. Uh, this... Uh, Text says it's not by works, and then it says it's by works. Let's look at it. <laughs> Ephesians 2, verse 8. We're all there. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man boast. That goes along with what we've been talking about. But notice, a miracle takes place. For we are his what? Workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to good works which God has foreordained that we should walk in them. Will there be good works in the life of the believer? Yes. Indeed, there will. It's the miracle of the new birth. The Holy Spirit comes in. And when we give our heart to Jesus, we've just given the Holy Spirit permission to come into our lives and begin to carve this away from our life and that away so that we become more and more like Jesus every day. Amen. Somebody told me the other day that I talked too fast. I hope not. These are precious truths. Somebody said that to Doug Vassar one time. And he said, well, then you just have to listen faster. <laughs> Righteousness and salvation and our good works are by, the grace of, are by the grace of faith. Do we still believe in miracles? Yes. So then faith empowered by the Holy Spirit, brings good fruits into the life. God is looking for the precious fruit. One day the disciples and Jesus are walking along. The disciples said, look, little fat master, look at this beautiful tree. And he said, it just needs to be cut down. What, Lord? Why cut it down? It's such a beautiful tree. <clears throat> it doesn't have any fruit. Matthew 7, 19 and 20 speaks of this. There must be fruit or else the tree is cut down. Salvation is by grace through faith. That's why any one of us or all of us can come to God by Christ Jesus without delay. We must do that. We must do that here this morning and every day that we, that we live. <clears throat> we don't have to clean the big mess up first. It doesn't have to happen. In that chapter 4 of Hebrews that we read, where Paul talks about the entering of rest of, by Christ's redemptive work, his complete work, it's like the, like the conclusion of the creation week, right? 
Adam and Eve's first day on earth was a Sabbath day. It was a rest. They had entered into the rest of, uh, of their wonderful inheritance. Paul finishes that discourse in Hebrews 4. Let's, let's turn back to Hebrews 4 again. Hebrews chapter 4. I keep racing that clock. And I'm going to be done fairly soon. I like to do that for the children. I know that this is a long time. Hebrews 4. I used to sit in a little church. There were about 10 people in that church in Idaho. I was a boy. And uh, my dad usually had to have the sermon. What did he do? He read an article out of the Review and Herald. (laughs) If you don't think that was boring, (laughs) I can still remember as a little boy sitting there and, wow, (laughs) it took a long time. (laughs) Some of those articles were long. (laughs) Hebrews 4 verse 9 there remains therefore a rest to the people of God verse 11 let us labor therefore we talked about not working right let us labor therefore to enter into that work the work of God is what believe okay let us labor to enter into that, into that rest, lest any man fall after the example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow. And it is, dis- and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And then 14 to 17. See then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus Christ the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. The Bible says, he that endureth to the end will be saved. In Matthew chapter 24, it says it twice. For we have not such a high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as like we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come what? Boldly to the throne of grace. We are his sons and daughters, right? How could we but do that? That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. One might throw up his hands in unbelief and say, isn't there something I can do? (laughs) Right? The Bible says don't do it. (laughs) I'll tell you, this salvation is really... It's amazing. There is something you can do. If you must, the word here that we just read is labor, right? It says, that's what Paul is saying in the Hebrews. The Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Yes, work to know Jesus. Miracle takes place when you do that. It's not by works, lest any man boast. He's talking here about the works of the flesh. Don't do that. Don't. And when you don't, you rest. Spend much time with God's word. Allow the Holy Spirit to acquaint you with Jesus point by point. And you'll have something to share with your neighbor. That's really really the end result of all this. You'll have a testimony of victory over sin. Pray for deliverance from fresh fleshly lusts and sins. So that, you rest, so that you can rest in God's promises. Do that every morning. Do you remember that verse, Romans 1, 16 and 17, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation, Paul wrote. It's the power in the life that is mediated to us by the Holy Spirit and his comforting, convicting, restorative power. It's a lonely journey to do this on your own, I'll tell you that. And I've been there and done that. If we do it on our own, that journey has no destination except death. Learn to know Jesus, whom to know is eternal life. He gave his life for us. Faith in Jesus cometh by hearing the word. Spend much time in secret, as the hymn says, with Jesus alone as the Holy Spirit shows you the things of Christ.
my time is up. I'm just going to very quickly come to a conclusion here. I want us to sing a song. It's a prayer song. It's found in hymn, it's hymn number 330. Sitting at the feet of Jesus. That's how we rest. Our loving Father in heaven, what else can we say? You have done a work for us, Lord, that we can, that we can rest in. Please give us that rest today, Lord. It's Sabbath day, a symbol of that rest, that heavenly rest that we'll have over there. Please help us to take it to heart and to love you back with a love that the Holy Spirit, only the Holy Spirit can give us. May we give ourselves totally and fully to you. And then I pray, Lord, that you will be with each of us here, each according to our several needs. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.